Hello everyone, uh, my name is Marta and I work for Data Art Company, which is the organizer of tonight's uh, webinar. And I will be your moderator. And <clears throat> welcome to our Java IT talk. We are uh, very glad that you decided to take a little bit of your time and join us to listen to our speaker, Serhi Bishir. Serhi is a software engineer working for Hazelcast company. So we are glad that he accepted our invitation. And before we start, I would like to mention that if you want to join uh, our future events, please follow our social media and uh, the links you will find uh, below the video. Also, we would really appreciate if you could stay with us till the end and fill in a short questionnaire after the webinar, which also you will find below the video. Um, also, don't be shy. If you have any questions to our speaker, you may type it in in the YouTube chat. Today, we will have two parts uh, of our talk. So between those parts, we will have a very short five minute break. And uh, I guess that's it from my side. So, Serhi, you are welcome to introduce yourself and to start your talk. Thank you, Marta. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, let's start our talk. Today we are going to talk about Kubernetes and Istio uh, and how to run a simple JVM application uh, to make it run in Kubernetes with Istio from scratch. Uh, so my name is Sergey. I work for Hazelcast. I'm a senior software engineer in cloud native team. You can see my contacts. If you have any video afterwards, you can contact me uh, in Twitter or via email. Um, I will try to answer your questions. So today we are going to talk about Docker, how to run the application in Docker, how to make it run inside the Kubernetes and how to uh, roll out Istio on top of it. And each part will have a short de demo. Uh, so first of all, why do we need to talk about uh, Kubernetes and Istio? Since we are, uh, most of us are Java developers. Uh, and why do we need to care about Kubernetes and Istio since it's not really Java related thing? Uh, and the answer is DevOps. And DevOps, not like DevOps engineer as a position in the company, uh, but DevOps as a methodology which means that every developer should know how to run their own application in the production. Uh, so we don't need to have like a separate dev team and the separate ops team and the so-called wall of confusion between them so that developers doesn't know uh, how the application runs in production or uh, ops team doesn't know uh, what the Java, what the application do. It should be uh, one team that works together. Of course, someone knows how to write code better, other knows how to run it, how to operate uh, the application, but every member of the team should know uh, the whole life cycle of the application, the whole process. Uh, this is the first reason why do we need as a Java developers to know about such things as Kubernetes and Istio. Uh, but here uh, we can have the questions, why do we need it at all? Because we have uh, the nice, Spring Boot, Spring Cloud that can do everything for us. Uh, so maybe it's not needed at all. Um, yeah, it was the case before, but uh, for now, since we have microservices, it, it introduces another complexity and another cost of microservices. Uh, so first of all, this is the infrastructural cost. So uh, when we have, uh, when we had the monolith, we could have just one application, it connects to the database. Uh, but for now we can have multiple microservices. It could use different databases. It could not use databases at all, or, or uh, it could run somewhere else. And somehow we need to operate all of this. And uh, we need to have infrastructure for this. Um, we cannot use operation a virtual machine for this because this is pretty costly. We will need to have the full running operational system just for running a single small microservice. And this is uh, quite expensive. Uh, and we need to have some sort of uh, other virtualization level, which is container. Con uh, so containers, what is containers? Containers, instead of having the full uh, running operational system, will provide you with some so-called 
container engine, which will allow you to have the minimal amount uh, of resources, to consume minimum amount of resources, so that you can run your own application within the same operating system. And still will give you the needed isolation between these applications. And the most popular container engine is, of course, Docker. Uh, so Docker, uh, to have uh, a Docker container, you will need, first of all, to write a Docker file, which is pretty simple syntax, we will see it today, to build from this Docker file, Docker image, and then from this image to run the container. This is how the Docker uh, file usually looks like. It has some directives. So first of all, it's uh, it has some base image. In this case, first line from OpenJDK. We have a base image with the OpenJDK version 8 installed. Uh, we are setting where uh, the work directory is located. We can copy some files into this work directory and then run some comments. And the last line is uh, the entry point of our container. So in this case, this is running Java application. Um, and each image uh, uh, is built on top of the previous image. So as we can see, we had this open JDK and you can have your own base image with some other thing installed inside the container if you need it. Um, so this is basically what Docker is. Uh, let's have a short demo. So let me show first of all the application that we have. So this is a simple application uh, which is written in Kotlin. Um, let me run it and I will show you what it does. Okay, so it started. I will need to start one more thing, which is my UI, which I build uh, in React. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, this is my application. Uh, so the thing is that I love coffee. Uh, I drink coffee every day, uh, usually in the morning because I cannot sleep if I drink it in the afternoon. But I, I don't really know which type of coffee uh, to choose because I don't really uh, care about it. So I built this application uh, so it can decide for me based on very hard algorithm called random, it can decide which uh, coffee should I choose, should I drink today. So I'm just pressing the button, it sends the request to uh, my microservice. So here's the request and it returns the, the response uh, with the type of coffee, the region and the name of this coffee. So that's it. For now it runs locally, everything is fine. Let's try to dockerize this application and to run it inside the Docker. So first of all, I have Docker file. Uh, I'm using the feature of the Docker, which is called multi-staging build. This multi-staging build allows me uh, to have uh, like two images. First one, first one will build my application. I will have a jar. And the second one will copy this jar from the previous build. And I will have a Docker with this jar file without Maven, without any additional dependencies, uh, just with the Java, which uh, will run. Okay, let me stop the application. My UI still works, but my backend doesn't work anymore. You can see if I press it, it tells me uh, that it cannot connect to it. Uh, I'm getting gateway timeout. Uh, so, okay, let me run the docker build command. Uh, I'm telling uh, the name of this container and I'm telling the location of my docker file. So in this case, it's here when I'm located. So I put just the dot. I run this command and it built me uh, this image. As you can see, I have here this image with the tag latest. Uh, okay, it tells me that it's created 28 hours ago. 
probably because I did it before uh, and it didn't change. Uh, okay. Uh, so since it's uh, it didn't change, it's like uh, take it from the cache. Now let's run, oops, not here. Let's run this Docker image. I'm running it, I'm telling the name of it, and I'm exposing the port 8080 to my local host so that I can uh, access it from my local machine. I'm running docker run command. Okay, so it's running for now. I can run application, uh, run the UI application again, and you can see that I can access it again. Uh, but it's not running locally, it's running inside the Docker. So basically that's it. Uh, you need to do just these simple steps to have a Dockerized JVM application. Okay, uh, let's stop it and move to our presentation. Okay, so we have one application Dockerized, but uh, we are talking about microservices. So it's usually not enough to have just one application inside the Docker, you, you don't need it actually. You need containers when you have multiple uh, applications, microservices actually. Uh, so here we are having now operational complexity because we have a bunch of containers. We have our uh, machine with our cluster actually with different nodes. Uh, and we need to run this container inside of these nodes. But then we have a lot of questions like, what happens if uh, some node fails? What happens if the container fails? What happens if some node doesn't have enough resources and we need to uh, reschedule this container to another node? So all of this causes a lot of confusion. And we might think that, okay, we need to implement this, but this is actually not uh, why we are doing a microservices uh, for. We, we want to uh, build microservices because we need to go to production faster and not to build this infrastructure. And this is the first problem. And the second one is if we do it by ourselves from the scratch, uh, it won't be as we expected. So instead of having a uh, running application and maybe resolving the issues with our application, we will have to resolve the issue with our orchestration system. So with, with the thing that we build to run this application. Uh, so for this reason, we need to use Kubernetes, which is for now the standard way, one of the standard way and most popular way to run containerized applications and to run microservices. Uh, so let's take a look at the um, application, the, the components of Kubernetes. So the main component, the base component of uh, Kubernetes is a pod. What is pod? Uh, so uh, in many languages, and including English, uh, different type of animals, when they are uh, into the group, they have different name. For example, it's pride of lions. It's not a group of lions, it's a pride of lions. Uh, for the giraffes, it's a tower of giraffes. And for the whales, it's called pod. So group of whales is pod. And since for the Docker, the logo of the Docker is a whale, pod is uh, an instance which can have one or multiple Docker containers in it. So that's, this is what the pod is. But usually uh, no one uh, suggests to uh, create the pod from as it is. So uh, because pod is ephemeral structure, which can just fail. And if the pod fails, uh, it, it just disappears. So for that reason, we have uh, the next abstraction, which is called deployment. So we need to create the deployment, which creates replica set. And this replica set uh, can handle the pods. So we can tell how many uh, replicas of this application we need, for example, two, or, and we can easily scale it or downscale it. So we are creating deployment and we are having instances of our application. Uh, but to access uh, our application, because since we have multiple instances of our application, we need some sort of load balancer, which can uh, balance the traffic. So we, we, we don't need to access the pod directly. We need to uh, access some entry point 
and our traffic should be balanced between the spots. So for this reason, there is the next uh, Kubernetes object, which is called service. So we are creating service to access the port. Uh, and there are four types of services uh, inside the Kubernetes. So first of all, it's a cluster IP. This is the type of service that can be accessed only inside of the Kubernetes cluster. You cannot access it from the outside of the cluster. Uh, the next one is not port. This one is getting exposed to the outside world, so you can access it from the outside of the cluster uh, using node IP and some uh, generated port, uh, which is uh, generated from some range. Uh, you can access this service. Next one is load balancer. This one uh, works only with the cloud provider or with the additional external tools which actually creates the load balancer for each service. And you will have an external IP so you can access it. And the last one is external name. This is uh, such a virtual service that can allow you to access uh, external resources. So you can usually you can access external resources from Kubernetes without any external service. Uh, but, uh, for example, if you have some database which is running on some IP address and you know that in future it might change, it's better to create a service and access the service. So in future you may seamlessly change it. And the next thing is uh, ingress. Ingress is uh, something like API Gateway. This is an entry point to your microservice application. So usually since we will have multiple services to access um, for, for multiple service because it's a microservice application, we will need some entry point because we cannot uh, tell user if you need a shopping cart access this uh, entry point, if you need your catalog or recommendations access something else. Uh, so we need some entry point. And for this reason, we have ingress here. Uh, and this is how typical uh, service and architecture inside of the Kubernetes looks like. So we have ingress, we have service, which load balance to uh, your application itself, which is pod, uh, and it is handled by deployment and replica set. And also we have namespaces. Namespaces is the way to group your uh, um, resources. Uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot access from one namespace to other namespace. You can access it easily. It just for the matter of grouping it. Um, and for uh, controlling your Kubernetes cluster, there's a tool called kubectl or kubectl. Uh, this is just a CLI application which you can uh, run and access your Kubernetes cluster and do different things to it. Okay, let's have a demo of the Kubernetes. Uh, so I have uh, actually a Kubernetes cluster here. Uh, let's first of all create namespace called demo. Okay, so it's created. Uh, I can show you that I don't have any resources here. So you can see no resources find. Uh, so first of all, we will need to uh, run this application. Uh, I have all of the scripts here so you can uh, try it uh, by yourself after the presentation. Uh, I will show you the code. So first of all, we need to create the deployment. Uh, we are telling the name and we are telling the uh, Docker image which one to use. So. Let's run this. So it's created. I will show you that for now we have one deployment which created a replica set and it creates uh, the pod. Uh, we can also easily scale it. So let me scale it to three instances. You can see that for now we have three instances of this application. Uh, okay, and now let's uh, 
let's try to access it from from the outside of uh, from the outside of the cluster. For this, we need to create the service uh, with, for example, type uh, load balancer. So uh, here is another comment, which is kubectl expose. Uh, we are telling the type of the service, the name, of course. And uh, I don't know if you can see it. And the port uh, which we need to access. Okay, so let's run this comment. For now, if you will take a look at our resources, we can see that we also have uh, the service, coffee service, uh, with the type load balancer. Uh, this is the cluster IP, so this is actually uh, the internal IP. We cannot access it. And we have external IP, which is pending. Uh, since this is uh, creating the load balancer, it needs some time to create this uh, external uh, IP because it creates the load balancer inside uh, of the Google Cloud. Let us check. Okay, so it's available. And... First of all, it's not HTTPS. And if we will go to the endpoint coffee, because this is only the backend, you should be able to see the response of it. It might take some time because uh, could already create the load balancer, but it could not uh, initialize it completely yet. So it, it doesn't work like instantly, uh, but usually services are not created on, on demand that they are created like uh, pre previously. So you can scale application on the demand. This takes, uh, this is pretty fast operation depending on, on how long it takes for your application to start. Okay. Let me try it. Let me try to refresh it actually. And it's not HTTPS, of course. Actually, I think I, I yeah, of course I have to put port here because it exposes exposes on some port. It's not uh, on the default one. Uh, so we can see uh, the response from it. So we can connect our uh, UI application to run uh, and do it uh, as it is. Just a minute. Oh, yeah, some, someone helped me. Um, okay. Uh, so this is uh, with the uh, uh, service, but as I told you, usually there is ingress which exposes your application. Actually, I have. Uh, I have already application running inside the Kubernetes uh, on the default namespace. I have created uh, previously uh, because the ingress itself, it takes about 10 minutes to initialize, to configure everything. So uh, I have created it so we don't have to wait for, uh, uh, for the ingress itself. Uh, so here it is inside the Kubernetes, you can, uh, have it so uh, you can access it. I will share with you the API address. Uh, so you can see that inside of the Kubernetes, we have the ingress itself. Uh, and uh, everything that I have shown you with the command line can be actually uh, created using the YAML configuration files. So for example, we have for the deployment and for the service, we have a YAML. Uh, which has actually the same parameters, a bit more parameters than, than in the CLI because YAML allows you to do something more. Uh, but you can see that we have deployment here and we have service here. Uh, in the same way, uh, we have ingress, uh, which is uh, with just uh, based on the URL. For example, if it's slash coffee, it will redirect it to the coffee service. Uh, and everything else will uh, rather redirect to the UI service, which also runs inside of the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, okay, so uh, for the Kubernetes, uh, this is uh, also pretty simple. 
at least for some simple applications. Uh, so the next thing we, which we will uh, take a look at is Istio. Uh, we could actually have a little break, but I don't know, it's only uh, half an hour. So uh, should we have a break or, or we might continue as it is? Actually, I guess we might continue. There are no questions so far. So guys, if you have any, please do, uh, please type it in. Uh, but there is uh, just one small comment for you, Serhi, that uh, Bradley would be really grateful if you could share your link to GitHub with the audience. Uh, yeah, sure, I will. I actually have it. Uh, okay, so just a minute. So let me, I will share the path. So it's actually GitHub and the path is this one here. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, if there are any questions, I, I guess it's a good time to answer the questions about the Docker and Kubernetes because uh, the next part is about Istio and it will be like longer and uh, more complex. Okay, so I can see there is one uh, question. Why do I uh, have this command here in the Docker file? Uh, so this one, uh, this is, uh, I guess this is uh, actually a Docker issue because uh, this jar I'm copying from the previous step, which is build and uh, it does not have the privileges to uh, execute it. So I had to, had to do it. Actually, I'm not sure whether they didn't fix this issue yet. Maybe they did because last time when I checked, uh, it didn't run because it did, didn't have exec execution uh, rights. Uh, so I had to add it, but I haven't checked whether they fix it or not. Uh, I believe they should have because it was long, long time ago. Uh, okay, so- and there is uh, one more question. Uh, if, yep. if we may, if I may interrupt, uh, the question is from Bradley: Is the Kubernetes eight cloud hosting free? Uh, sorry, uh, is Kubernetes cloud hosting free? Uh, not exactly. So I'm using uh, Google Cloud, so it, it's not free. But uh, for for testing purpose or for actually. Uh, uh, exploring purpose they are they having free uh, tire which gives you three hundred dollars which you can use what what on whatever you want uh, from their services so you have uh, three hundred dollars which is uh, more than enough to explore kubernetes and to try all the features so th this also other cloud providers also have free tires uh, but for example, AWS doesn't have uh, Kubernetes service in the free tire, so you cannot try it for free. But for Google Cloud, you can. Okay, so there is also uh, one uh, comment which uh, I also should uh, uh, read. So it's, yeah, you, you can use, uh, uh, micro Kubernetes or uh, mini cube or other, th there is options to run it locally on your machine. Uh, even the Docker for Mac has the Kubernetes in it. So Docker for desktop actually. Uh, so if you go to the preferences, you can see there is a Kubernetes. So if you have Docker for desktop, you can run Kubernetes uh, locally. Uh, it consumes a lot of resources usually. Uh, but you can try to run uh, small applications on it and also explore Kubernetes. So yeah, th there are options to run it locally. There is uh, the most popular are Docker for desktop, Minikube and uh, Kind, which is which stands for Kubernetes in Docker. So there are options to run it uh, locally. Uh, 
uh, okay. If there are no other questions, then I guess we can continue to the uh, Istio part. Uh, so for now we have run a microservice application inside of the Kubernetes, uh, uh, which means that we are uh, now in the distributed world. And in the distributed world, we have a network communication between different services. Uh, and when there is a, a network communication, there is uh, something that happens there. And this something is called magic because no one knows what could happen when you have a distributed world, when you have networking. And uh, for this purpose, we, uh, to manage this networking, we have uh, such thing called service mesh, which is another abstraction on top of the Kubernetes. Uh, so uh, service mesh introduce uh, inside of each pod alongside with your service, another container, which is called sidecar. And every traffic that goes to your service uh, goes through this sidecar. So firstly, you access the sidecar and the same when the traffic uh, leaves your application, you go through the sidecar. And by this simple uh, thing, you can do a lot of uh, different, uh, you can introduce a lot of different uh, features uh, to manage the traffic that goes to your service. And Istio does this. This is one of the uh, implementations of service mesh. I believe most popular implementations of the service mesh is Istio. There are other options like uh, Linkerd2, for example. This is the main uh, alternative to Istio. But the most popular now and the most supported is uh, Istio. Istio uses Envoy, which is a reverse proxy. This is something like Nginx or, for example, uh, HA proxy. The same concept, um, except that Istio is uh, very fast and very configurable and extendable. Uh, so this is uh, the part which is called data plane. This is your application with the proxies alongside of it. And this is how it looks uh, in case of Istio. So inside of each pod, you will have Envoy sidecar and all the traffic will go to this Envoy sidecar. And there is also control plane, which is the main configurational part. So uh, since we don't want to configure each uh, proxy itself because we have multiple application in, in, in case of microservices, we can have hundreds of uh, different application, each applications have multiple instances. Uh, so we want one single point for configuration it. And this is control plane, which is called Istio D. Uh, we configure this. Also this Istio D can, uh, uh, can collect telemetry data and policy checks. Uh, if it's a metrics, logs, or, or something else. And it also can provide TLS certificates to encrypt the traffic inside of your uh, microservices. And also we have a gateway, which in case of uh, Kubernetes can substitute ingress. Uh, what is the point of substituting ingress? Uh, so first of all, uh, there is no a standard way to uh, configure ingress because each cloud providers, each Kubernetes uh, provider can provide uh, different ingresses. And the only way to configure this is uh, using annotations, which is not something in the standard way. So each provider has its own uh, type of annotations with different configurations. So it's, it's not possible just to, to have some standard way. Uh, the second reason for introducing gateway instead of ingress is uh, because ingress can um, forward traffic only using HTTP or HTTPS uh, ports. Uh, so it cannot uh, serve TCP traffic directly and gateway can, uh, can use any port and serve raw TCP traffic if it's needed. For example, you might have, uh, you might want to expose Kafka to outside world. Uh, and the third reason which is, uh, maybe the most important one and the, in, for the uh, implementation standpoint is that uh, they decided to separate the configuration of the API gateway and the configuration of what happens to traffic when it leaves it. 
so we for now have a simple gateway which only tells which endpoints will be exposed. And after that, you can do whatever you want uh, with this traffic using another abstraction. So we will see it later. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the uh, features that Istio provides. First of all, this is the resiliency issues, uh, resiliency features. So as uh, we already told, when we have network communication, everything might happen. The traffic might, might just, uh, uh, stuck somewhere in between, or you can get some network errors or, or something. So for this case, you need um, some retries and some timeouts in case if the network is really slow. One way to do it is to implement it inside of your application. But here um, you have the issue because uh, if you have microservices, you might decide to use different uh, libraries for different things. You might even decide to use different languages. So you will have to test for each case uh, that these libraries are compatible, these languages uh, introduce the same feature that uses the same API and so on. And Istio allows you not to care about it inside of your application and to move it to the infrastructural level. So you can set up, easily can set up retry and timeouts on the infrastructural level without bothering about it inside of your application. Um, the next thing uh, is uh, when your services uh, feels unhealthy in this case, so your, your services might fall. Uh, one reason for this might be that, uh, for example, your service can handle uh, the number of uh, some number of the requests. For example, let's say 1000 requests per second. Uh, so you know that your service uh, is okay when it serves 1000 requests per second, but at some point in time, you might uh, start to receive uh, more requests. And in this case, uh, your service will fall and even this 1000 requests per second that you can serve uh, won't be returned successfully. So all the users will experience uh, outage in, in your service. Easter Circuit Breaker allows you to set up uh, the number of the requests that your service can handle. Uh, it can set up the number of the requests that will wait for a free slot. And all the other requests will be just uh, returned as error before even getting to your service. In this case, you can secure your service that it will not be overloaded and it will not fall because uh, it's, uh, it receives more requests that it can it could actually handle or then you have resources. Uh, the next thing uh, which Istio provides is a thing called chaos engineering. Uh, so this is something that was introduced by Netflix. Uh, this is a practice that uh, tests your application for a different outages. So it was introduced by the tool called chaos, Man chaos monkey. Uh, which just goes to production and kill the services in, in production. Of course, uh, I wouldn't suggest you to use Chaos Monkey uh, from the scratch because if you don't do chaos engineering already, uh, testing in production won't be very good because I bet that your application won't sustain all the outages. So for this thing, I would suggest to start small and use your... Uh, uh, okay, sorry, I, I forgot to tell you that uh, they already have different army of monkeys which do uh, different stuff like introduce network delay or something. Uh, so as I told you, I won't suggest you to deploy all of this army to your application. Uh, and Istio allows you to start small with the fault, in the fault injection feature, uh, which allows you to introduce some errors on or delay inside of your application. So you can see how your application will behave in this outages. Uh, so this is uh, something that you can try on your testing environment or staging environment and you can see how your application will behave because you will receive errors and delays for sure if you're using microservices. Uh, okay, and the release strategies. One of more, uh, the most important part of uh, microservices is that uh, we can release it uh, each microservice separately, and we can do it without any downtime. And there are different release strategies which we can use for this. 
the first of all, uh, the first release strategy is rolling update. This is provided by Kubernetes. We don't have the Istio here. We can just uh, release the new version of our service one by one without any downtime. And in the same way, we can roll it back if something goes wrong. So this is uh, something that Kubernetes provides you out of the box. But this is not the most secure way of doing this because uh, if we release version two and we didn't test it well, all the users will uh, experience uh, this bug that we might have there. Uh, so we will have to roll it back, but still the users won't be happy because they experience this uh, issue. Uh, one way to avoid this is using blue-green deployment. Blue-green deployment uh, is the technique when you have both versions at the same time deployed, all the users are using version one. You can run all the tests on version two. And when you run all the tests and you are sure that everything works fine on this environment, you just switch uh, the users, all the traffic to go to the service too. Uh, so in this way, you have uh, some sort of uh, guarantee that everything works fine. But as it happens, usually it's not possible to, co to cover all the cases. And in production with the production traffic will happen something uh, which is not expected for sure. And to avoid this one, there is uh, another even more safe, uh, safe way of doing this, uh, which is called canary deployment. Uh, so canary deployment, uh, the name of it, it comes from miners. Uh, which used to uh, take some small bird like canary uh, to the uh, mines. And if there are some poisonous gas inside of there, uh, this bird will die quickly and they will have time just to get out of the mine. And in this way, there is uh, the bird will die, of course, which is not good, but the miners will survive, which is definitely good. Uh, the same technique uh, is used with the software engineer with the canary deployment. Uh, we have also two versions of our service at the same time. And most of the users are uh, using the old stable version. Some small percentage of the users, for example, 1% of the users will go to version two. So in this case, they are our canaries. And if there are some issues, some bugs, they will experience this. We will have the real feedback from the users. But in worst case scenario, we will lose only 1% of our users, which are not happy. Uh, and we will know about uh, the issues that are with our applications. Uh, and you can also do actually A-B testing uh, with some specific users uh, for example, it could be test users that are going to uh, version two, or it might, might be users that are using mobile phone or some specific browser or, or anything, even specific region. Um, and there's another uh, way of doing it. This is called shadow deployment. You also have both version at the same time. Users are using the old stable version, but all the traffic is getting uh, shadowed, like mirrored, to version two. So uh, you can see how your application will behave on the real production traffic. But in, at the same time, the users won't notice it. They will use uh, the, the old stable version of your service. Uh, and there is uh, advanced routing uh, feature of Istio, which allows you to do all of these things like uh, canary deployment, traffic mirroring, and so on. Uh, one more thing is encryption, uh, which also you, you still allows you to do out of the box. Uh, so actually this is by default enabled. So all the traffic inside the uh, cluster is encrypted. So service A to service B uh, talks via encrypted channels. So uh, Istio D provides the certificates and it even rotates the certificates from the uh, from this sidecars. And one of the most important thing in the microservices are of course observability, because uh, since we have a lot of application, a lot of e uh, instances of these applications, we need to set up a lot of telemetry data uh, just to be able to observe all the metrics, to observe the logs, uh, traces. 
And uh, usually for this, you have to set up a lot of tools. But with Istio, uh, since we have all of these proxies, this proxies uh, can talk to uh, control plane, Istio D. And we can just connect different tools like uh, tracing, metrics, logging, uh, et cetera. So for these reasons, uh, you can just set up, uh, just install uh, the tool that you need and it will be collect, it will be served with all the telemetry data. And there are a lot of tools available in the market and uh, most of them uh, have adapters for Istio so you can use it uh, out of the box with Istio. Um, okay, so let's go to our Istio demo part. Uh, so first of all, let's see uh, our application. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is our resources. So this is actually our pods. And you can see there's a ready uh, column, uh, which tells one out of one. It means that there is only one container inside of this pod. Uh, but with Istio, it will be a bit different. So first of all, let's delete uh, everything that we have. So this, uh, okay, just a minute, coffee service. Okay. Coffee room. And clips it tail, delete. ingress okay so i have deleted all the resources that we have inside of kubernetes now uh, let's uh, install the istio on top of the kubernetes uh, so for doing this we are using a tool called uh, istio ctl so here you also have all the commands available you will uh, be able to run these commands uh, and test it uh, so first of all, we are installing uh, Istio, running Istio CTL install, and we are using, in this case, profile called uh, demo, uh, which will install all the components available in Istio. Uh, okay, just a minute. I guess in this terminal, I don't have it. Yes. So it's processing and installing uh, everything inside of the Istio. So the next thing that we uh, will need to do is to enable uh, sidecar injection because we will be installing our application in the same way as we did with uh, Kubernetes. No additional step is needed, but we will need for our namespace uh, to set up a specific label, which is called Istio inject enabled. Uh, so in this case, every pod which will be created inside of this uh, namespace will be automatically by Istio injected with the sidecar. Uh, so it's installed, let's label it, and we can uh, check uh, the installation. It checks for every single component that it has. And we can see that Istio is installed successfully. Okay, uh, now let's uh, install our application. So we are again creating all the pods, all the deployment. And in this case, we are creating gateway. I'm creating it in advance since uh, it also will take some time before it's accessible. Uh, let's take a look at our resources now. So for now, uh, it's still creating, but we can see that in the ready state, uh, in the ready column, we have uh, for now zero out of two. It means that each pod instead of one container have two containers. Uh, so let's, let me run it. We can see that for some, it al it's already available. So actually these containers are our application itself. 
And as well, uh, this is uh, Envoy proxy alongside with our application. Uh, okay, uh, so let's see what can go wrong with uh, our application and how Istio can help uh, with it. Uh, so first of all, uh, I will deploy another version of my service. Uh, this version is unstable. Let us wait uh, when it's ready. Uh, okay, by the way, I need also the API for my gateway because uh, not API, IP for my gateway. Okay. It might also take some time before. So maybe, Serhi, maybe we can uh, answer a few questions in the meantime, if you're fine. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so we have one question. Any chance that ECO helps to set up distributed tracing of incoming outgoing requests between services in cluster so we can match request flow in logs? Uh, yes, actually uh, it does. The, there are distributed tracing tools uh, in Istio. So uh, by default, there is uh, out of the box available. You can install add-ons for uh, Zipkin or for Jager. Uh, so actually, we, we will take a look at it uh, today. So uh, yeah, distributed tracing is available in Istio, in other words. OK, and another one. In the Canary deployment, do the two different versions of the services share the same database or using different instance? If different if different database servers with potentially different schema, how manage the merge? Uh, so actually, uh, this is a really good question. So for the Canary deployment, uh, usually it's done uh, using the same database instance. Uh, because there are, uh, for both cases, this is a real users. So this is our production environment. So for this case, this is uh, why we are using the same database instance. Uh, for the traffic mirroring thing, which we will also see today, uh, this is uh, also, uh, usually it could be the same database uh, but we might keep in mind that the traffic will be duplicated. So in case if our uh, requests are not idempotent, uh, we might need to set up a different database instance. Uh, regarding the merge, uh, so in the microservice world, uh, usually the changes in the database is done in backward compatible way. Uh, it means that if we want, for example, to rename so some column, we should not rename it. We should create another column. And for some time, we will have to handle both. Uh, after we uh, migrated all our services to the new version, we are sure that uh, the old column is not used anymore. We, uh, after this, we can delete it. So uh, for this case, this is not uh, today's topic, but I can suggest, suggest you a book called uh, migrating to microservice database, if I'm not mistaken. It's uh, uh, written by Edson Yanaga from Red Hat. Uh, so this book describes uh, pretty well all of these cases. So I can suggest you uh, trying this book, uh, reading this book. It's pretty small and it's available for free on the Red Hat uh, website. So um, I can suggest you reading this. It describes all of these cases, but the short answer is that the changes into the database schema should be in the backward compatible way. Okay, and there is a small comment from Dmitry. Thank you, Dmitry, that you missed the first three in IP when you copied the IP. So maybe that's the, the issue here. Oh, thank you, Dmitry. You saved us a lot of time because I, I, I would be going with debugging it uh, uh, or something. Yeah, th this is a great comment. Uh, and. And also one more question. Could you share the code of demo with ECO install and other commands too? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, actually the part that I shared, so uh, it's available on the GitHub. There's there are all of these commands. Uh, so uh, there is a demo folder inside of that repository, and there are all of these commands available there. So you can you can use it. Okay, and last one, is it way to see code coffee slash UI? Yeah, it also is available in that repository. So I don't I didn't really want to show it because I'm not a front end developer by any way. So I, I don't know if it's a good React application or it's a really bad code, but it's available there. So you can you can try it. Actually, it's nothing hard here. It, it's just a simple application using uh, Bootstrap uh, that sends the requests to, uh, to the backend. So it's available also. All, everything uh, that I show you today is available in that repo. So you can try everything, try to run everything. Uh, you can even make some changes in the code. Uh, but don't judge me because of the UI code because I'm not a front-end developer. So. Um, OK, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, so far, no. I, I guess we can uh, we can move on. OK, great. Uh, OK, so here is our application. Let me actually share it as well, because this is a different uh, IP address for now. Uh, OK. Uh, yeah. Let me refresh it. Yeah, so uh, we are sending the requests. But sometimes, since I have deployed the unstable version, uh, which returns error. Sometimes we can see that uh, we are sending the request. Sometimes it's successful, but sometimes we are receiving the errors. Uh, this is expected. Uh, so we might try to debug it. We might try to, uh, to fix this issue. But uh, first of all, we, uh, we uh, need to understand what the problem is. And for this, uh, we need uh, the telemetry data, we need the metrics, we need even the traces. And as I told you, Istio provides this out of the box. Uh, we, the only thing that we need to do is install uh, the add-ons, which is, uh, in my case, I will install Grafana, Jager, and Prometheus. So I'm installing them. And there is also other thing called Kiali. Uh, this is specific uh, telemetry data for Kubernetes. I will show you it as well. Uh, I'm installing it separately because there is a bug actually. You have to install it twice because uh, the monitor monitoring dashboard is not created and uh, it throws some exceptions. Oops. But if you install it the second time, everything uh, passed successfully. So this, this is actually a bug that they have. It's not so critical, but uh, still it, it's there. Uh, okay, so I have installed it. And now uh, I want to check. Uh, okay, so let me send some more requests so that we have data inside of uh, Prometheus, inside of the Jager. Okay, so we're experiencing some delays as well. Something went wrong, so okay, we have sent some uh, some requests. Uh, so uh, the tool, which is called Istio CTL or Istio Control, uh, allows you to view uh, the dashboards without uh, having exposed it to the outside world. Uh, it allows you to see the dashboards uh, forward to your local host. So you have to run command Istio dashboard, and then you have the list of the dashboards available here. So first of all, let's see Grafana dashboard. So you, you saw that I haven't set up anything. I just installed the Grafana add-ons. Uh, and I have all of the dashboards available that 
takes all the data from the Prometheus and displays it uh, in pretty nice way. So for example, we can see that the success, success rate is 72%. In, for the server success rate, it's 66%. Uh, so we can see that uh, we are receiving some errors, but it's uh, not, not very often. Uh, so to fix it easily and quickly, we might set up just the retries uh, for our uh, requests. Uh, for this, we have a special uh, YAML file. Of course, it's YAML. Uh, so, uh, which uh, creates the virtual service uh, and it sends uh, the request to, which sends the request to, to, uh, to this path, URI, and it set up the retries. So we will set up the retry with the uh, timeout per retry of two seconds and retry on errors 500. So it's actually server errors. Uh, so let me just run it. Okay, I will have to kill this command. Okay, so uh, that's it. I have installed it and now, okay, I have some issues with the UI of application. Let me refresh the browser. Okay, so now I can uh, I can run the comments, and I can see that there are no errors anymore on the uh, on the UI. Uh, but if I will check, for example, let me check actually this time Jagger which is distributed tracing tool, which is as well available here. So we can find tra traces and we can see that we still receive the errors here, uh, but we can see that we received the error twice and the third time it's successful. So we can see that there are the, the application is sending the request. It receives error the first time, uh, send it, uh, send the retry again the error and then we receive the successful results. So we are sending up to three retries in case of the errors. So the application is still unstable, but still uh, we uh, are receiving this uh, uh, user don't experience it. So this is a um, pretty quick way to make your application more, re more resilient in case if it's unstable or even if it could be some network errors, which is not dependent on our application and just how the network, network is. Um, okay, so let me clean this up. Um, okay, I will delete the unstable. Uh, and I will apply the gateway uh, YAML as well. So uh, by the way, I didn't show you the gateway YAML. So uh, in case of the gateway, you can see that I have the gateway object, which just tell, uh, tell me, uh, tell the application uh, which port should be exposed and which protocol it is. And then I have the virtual services which tells you where to redirect the traffic. So uh, we can see that we have the separation, separation of concerns, uh, which we don't have in case of Kubernetes ingress. Uh, so we have the virtual service, which just uh, is used to redirect traffic. So we know, we know that when we send a request to the slash coffee, it's for the coffee service. Uh, when it's uh, just simple slash, it's for the coffee UI, which is the UI of our application. Uh, Okay, so I have uh, cleaned up the previous scenario and now let me uh, deploy the next service, the next unstable service. In this case, it will be uh, the service which is uh, slow. It has some delays injected in the code. So uh, we will see how it behaves. Let me actually just see all the pods. You can see it's uh, being deployed. We have uh, one container ready, the second is starting. Okay, so our application is here. And now 
I'm experiencing some delay, but it actually, I don't know if it's the problem with my UI or actually the delay which is injected there. So let me refresh the browser. Okay, so uh, yeah, you can see I am uh, sending the requests, but it takes a bit of time sometimes. Uh, if we will check this networking, we can see that there are requests which takes uh, three seconds to respond. So actually this is the delay which I have injected in into the code. Uh, so whenever I'm sending the requests, sometimes it goes to the stable application, sometimes to the one which is pretty slow. Uh, for uh, the users, sometimes it might be convenient just to uh, receive the error so they can retry it by the, themselves. Uh, so it could be for uh, different business cases. Uh, for example, uh, even in this case, maybe I don't want to wait for three seconds. It's, it's faster for me to press the button once again when I receive the error. So for this case, we uh, might need, need to set up some timeouts as well. Uh, so we have, again, a uh, virtual service. And uh, as in the previous example, we had uh, the configuration is the same, but we had the retry section there. And here we have the timeout section, which uh, is in this case is set up for half a second. So let me install it. Traffic service is still timeout. Okay, so I have set up it. Now you can see that instead of waiting for three seconds, after half a second, I'm receiving the error, uh, which is actually the timeout error. You can see gateway timeout. Uh, so for some cases, uh, for user might be, okay, this is again the issue with my UI because there are some requests which are pending. So uh, you can see that I'm waiting only for half a second and then receiving the errors, the, the error itself. So this is uh, also one option that we uh, might uh, want to have. Did I stop this? Yes. Uh, so let's see our dashboard. Okay. With the distributed traces. So we can see that we have uh, the requests with half a second and the error received. This is uh, our timeout. Same here. And we have uh, the fast requests for uh, four milliseconds. Uh, okay, so uh, let me clean up this scenario as well. Okay, uh, next let's take a look at um, uh, fault injection feature that we have with Istio. Let me stop this one. I will refresh the application. We can see that everything works fine. So I have reverted everything. So everything is nice. Now without deploying a new broken versions, I want to try how my application will behave in case of some errors. Uh, again, I have, uh, virtual service here. The configuration is the same, but I have the fault section and I'm injecting HTTP status 500 for 50% of the requests. So, uh, okay. Let me apply this configuration. Coffee service is to fault injection error. Okay, the configuration is applied. Now I can send uh, requests and I can see that I'm receiving errors. Even though my application is stable because it's the stable version deployed there, I can test how my application will behave if something goes wrong, maybe with networking, maybe with the application itself, maybe uh, with my cloud provider. Uh, but still I can, uh, I will know how user will experience it. Uh, okay, let me uh, now try to test what will happen in case of some networking delay. So I have to deploy again, uh, virtual service. 
And in this case, I also have the fault section, but in uh, this case, I have delay with the five second fixed delay for all 100% uh, percent of the requests. Um, okay, let me apply it. Let me send the requests. And you can see that we are uh, receiving this delay of five seconds. You can see here, it's five seconds. Uh, it's, it's pretty small. I hope you can see the numbers here. Uh, but every request takes uh, five seconds uh, to respond. So again, without deploying any broken version of my application, I can just test how the application will behave when the user will experience some network delay or slowness of the service itself. Uh, actually, it might be everything, but we can test it easily. Um, okay, let me clean up this. And now I want to show you uh, the new version of my application. So you might notice that I have language uh, button here. Uh, so, uh, sorry, it's Ukrainian language. Uh, Believe me, it's just saying the same as here, but in Ukrainian language. So uh, I can change the language of my UI. You can see that everything is Ukrainian, uh, at least not English. Uh, but the name of uh, the region, for example, Philippines, and the type of the coffee, it's still in English. This is because uh, my backend service doesn't support multi -languages, uh, multiple languages. So for this reason, I have created uh, version number two, which supports it. Uh, but I want to deploy it and to be uh, secure, to make sure that it will work as I expected and users won't uh, get any issues with that. Uh, so actually, let's see the strategies for uh, release strategies that uh, we have available with Kubernetes in Istio. Let's see them in practice. Uh, so first of all, this is the rolling update uh, available in Kubernetes. So by running this command, uh, kubectl set image, and I'm saying that deployment setting to image version number two, uh, I will be able to uh, deploy it without any downtime. And in the same way I can, um, uh, reverted back. So first of all, let me run the command. <clears throat> and I can check the status of it. We can see that we are waiting for the deployment. We're allowed to finish one out of two. So actually it set up the new instance and killing the old one. If I am going to my application, uh, okay, so it's, the issue. I can see that I'm still receiving the English here. If I will uh, press it a little bit more, I can see that after some time, I will start receiving uh, the Ukrainian uh, language here. Oh, sorry, I have to check, change it to Ukrainian first. Yeah, so you can see sometimes it's Ukrainian. Uh, this is Arabica in Ukrainian. And sometimes it's English, the same Arabica. After some time, When my uh, deployment, okay, so we can see now that it's done, I will only receive Ukrainian language. Uh, so my deployment is ready. Uh, the new version has been set up and the old version has been removed. So without any downtime, I can redeploy the new version. Uh, but if I have some bugs here, all the users will experience it. Uh, Luckily for us, so the good news is that we can uh, revert it back. So we can use kubectl undo, uh, no, roll out, undo. Uh, so I'm uh, running this command and it will revert it to the previous state. If I will uh, check the status again, I can see that it has the same messages as before. Just this time, it will revert it back to the previous stable version. So uh, let me run this for a few times. 
okay you can see now we are receiving robusta in english so it's uh the old stable version and after some some times uh when the deployments the, the uh roll, rolling deployments is reverted back we will receive only the english version so which means that this is the previous old version which doesn't support multiple languages i believe it's already done yeah so this is rolling deployments available in Kubernetes. Uh, let me uh, show you the next thing which we uh, can have, which is actually canary deployment and blue-green deployment. First of all, uh, let's try with the blue-green deployment. For this, I will need to have uh, both versions, uh, the old and the new at the same time. CTL. Service, service version two. So I'm deploying it. I will have it at the same time. It's initializing, uh, should be created soon. Okay, one is ready. So if I run this application, I can see that for now I'm being load balanced between two versions. So here it's Robusta in Ukrainian, here it's Arabica in uh, English. So I'm being load balanced, but I don't want my real users to see the new version because it's not yet tested. Uh, so first of all, I will uh, deploy the virtual service. Uh, which, tells, which tells me that I want to redirect all the traffic to the subset version one. But what is the subset version one? Subset version one is uh, specified in the destination rule. This is another uh, object that we can create with Istio. Uh, when we, uh, where we can uh, set up that for a specific host, we have two subsets and it should be uh, uh, split by this Kubernetes label. Label is just a key value, uh, key value, uh, key value, some uh, data, which we can set up in the pods we, in the deployment. So first of all, let me create the destination rule. For service is to destination rule. I have created it. Uh, I can see that Nothing is changed after I created destination rule. Again, Ukrainian language, English. Ukrainian, English. So this is because uh, I didn't set up any rules. I just set up that the traffic should be split into the subset. Now I need to uh, set up the virtual service, which I showed you. Request routing, all version one. And now I can see that all the users uh, are accessing only the version one. It's always English here. Uh, and I can test how my application behaves. But how I, can I test it? First of all, I can uh, run some, some isolated tests some maybe deploy some application uh, and tell it to go to, to this pod and check uh, that the response is what we are expecting. This is one way. The other way is traffic mirroring. Uh, this is uh, when we uh, are sending the real production traffic to the new version, but users won't notice it. Uh, let me uh, show you the logs of this application. Uh, okay. Logs of this new pod, so you can see it's version two. If I'm sending some requests, you can see that there are no new logs here. It means that uh, it doesn't send the traffic to uh, to the version two of my application. So I'm sending some requests. Version two doesn't receive anything. Uh, now, if I will set up the traffic mirroring, again, virtual service with the different configuration, it has the same as the previous one, sends all the traffic to version one, but also the section mirror to coffee service subset version two. 
Uh, okay, so let me apply it. Coffee service is still mirroring. I have just applied it. Now I'm sending the requests. It's still English, which means that the users receive the old version. You can see it. But if I will check the logs, I can see that it receives also uh, this request. Uh, so in this way, I can check how my, applications my application is behaving on the real production traffic, but users won't notice it because they will be using the old version. So the response of it is just ignored. Uh, okay, so this is one way. Uh, another way uh, is canary deployment, which I showed, uh, which I uh, explained to you. And uh, let me explain how it will be uh, behaving in my case. So in my case, I have set up the canary deployment, again, virtual service, which will uh, redirect all the traffic from the Chrome users. Uh, I'm, filtering by, I, I'm filtering it by the request header. Uh, to the version two. So basically all the users which are using Google Chrome browser will be my canary. And all the other users which are using any other browser or maybe a mobile phone or something else uh, will be uh, redirect to the version one. So only the users which are using Google Chrome will test my application. So I will receive the real feedback from, from them. Uh, let me again, Apply it. Apply. Uh, Coffee service. Okay. Uh, so now let me, of course, my UI change the language to Ukrainian. You can see this is a uh, Ukrainian language. So every time I receive Ukrainian language. But if I will go to Safari browser, for example, the same application, let me change the language, you can see that it's English. So all other browsers will uh, use the stable version except my uh, users which are using Google Chrome browser. Okay. Uh, so one more thing is uh, regarding the encryption. As I told you, the encryption uh, dashboard. The encryption is done in Istio out of the box. Uh, so uh, if we will check, oops, I didn't mean to press that. Ah. Okay, so if we are going to check our service with the client's uh, workload, which is actually, uh, okay, this is not that one. The service, yeah, this one. We can see that uh, the traffic here has this MTLS, uh, key and the locker, uh, which actually means that this traffic is encrypt encrypted using mutual TLS, uh, which is done def by default in the Istio. So I haven't set up anything at all. Uh, I just have deployed Istio and it's encrypted by default. Of course, it could be disabled, uh, but it doesn't uh, gives you any significant overhead. So I would suggest just using it because it's Additional uh, additional security that we you are saving out of the box without any significant overhead. Uh, okay, so this is uh, basically most of the Istio features, but I want to show you one more not so obvious feature that can be uh, used with the help of Istio, uh, and this feature can be used in one scenario. There are some bugs which are not reproducible. Uh, anywhere except the production. It happens sometimes you uh, have to have exactly the same configuration. Uh, and this could be not so, such an obvious bug, which usually you will need to debug. 
but how to debug when it's the production? Uh, of course, you can try remote debugging, uh, but not all the time you have the access to open specific ports or to the production to connect to it. Uh, so it's, it's not something really secure. And uh, for this reason, uh, we need to debug it somehow in other way. And I will show you how we can use Istio for this. Uh, first of all, there is such tool called ngrok, which allows you to uh, create a tunnel from uh, your local machine to outside world. So I have run this command. I set up which port I need to uh, forward. And now I can see that here by this URL, which is accessible to outside world, Uh, okay, just a minute, I have to start the application first, of course. So if I will start this application by using this URL, I can access my uh, application actually. Uh, so here is the URL that I have. Let me actually start in, it in the debug mode and let me set up some breakpoint here in the controller. Uh, you can see that I'm accessing this application and I'm receiving the uh, debug breakpoint here inside of my application. Uh, okay, so now I have this production environment and I want users when they are sending the request, uh, I want to, to debug it. Uh, so I will show you uh, some object which I have to create. First of all, this is the service entry object, uh, which is uh, something like the gateway, but for the outside world. So I will specify that uh, I have this entry and whenever I'm trying to access this host, I should go outside of the, uh, outside of the cluster. And the second thing is virtual service, uh, which Whenever I have this X debug header set to true, I want to redirect this traffic to this URL. So first of all, I have to change this URL to the new one because ngrok2 uh, generates uh, the new URL every time when you are running it. Uh, so I'm set up in this header because I don't want every, uh, every production traffic to be sent to my local machine in the debug because it will definitely cause some outage uh, of the production. So I'm set up in that whenever there is this header and this URL, redirect it to this, uh, to this uh, URL. In all the other cases, when there is no this header, just use the standard version two of uh, my service. Okay, now let me apply it. Okay. Oops. Coffee service. Okay, so I have applied it. Let's go to production, sending requests. Nothing happens, of course, because I don't have this header set. So I can see that uh, the production users won't notice any difference. But now if I will set up this X debug header to true, this is just a Chrome plugin. If you're wondering what, what this is, it allows you to set some requests and response headers. And I'm sending this request. You can see that from the production request, I can go inside of my application and debug it, try to see uh, what's wrong with this application, why exactly we're receiving this error. Uh, so in this case, it's like a remote debugging, but without having to uh, open any uh, unsecure ports to the outside world. Uh, okay, so after everything is good, I can just uh, oh, I can just apply version two request routing. Ah, oh, should be here. Yeah. I can just set up 
the virtual service, which will tell that every request should go to version two because we are ready to deploy version two and to, to use it. Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. I have to. It's cached. Uh, yeah, of course, I have to remove the previous. I have to clean up the previous one, the bug rewrite. Just a minute. Oh. Okay, let me just clean up the, the previous version. Still the bug. And now apply request starting all to version one. Something goes wrong because it still sends, I guess my browser just cached, just cached this request and now it all the time it sends it to ngrok. Uh, okay, but this is a browser issue. Uh, in any case, so uh, we have seen uh, the most important Easter features. These uh, are not all the Easter features because there are plenty other more advanced which you can use uh, that you can set up and uh, take advantage of Istio for your application. Uh, so here you have the source code. Uh, I think I will share the link. I already did, but if you didn't receive it, I will uh, share uh, once again. Uh, so let's go to the summary. Uh, so first of all, we have seen how to dockerize our applications uh, and how to run, how to use Docker. Then how we can uh, use Kubernetes for orchestration, uh, orchestrating our microservices and how to use Istio uh, and take advantage of its features uh, for our applications. But the most important thing is that uh, tools can help you but uh, it won't do your job. So always uh, be aware that you're responsible for the thing that you are uh, creating. Uh, so that's it from, from me today. Uh, I would be glad to answer all the questions that you have. So uh, Mata, do you have any questions? Yes, actually I can see one. So okay. could you clarify, does Istio provide requests, response, response caching features? And if do, what configuration possibilities do you know? And how and where to configure TTL, cache size, cache storage, etc.? cetera? Uh, so uh, actually, um, Istio out of the box doesn't provide it. Uh, so th there is no uh, API uh, for the YAML to, to write it out of the box. Usually uh, Istio uh, uses all the features that Istio have is the exactly the same features that Envoy have. Uh, so for, for some features, it's not available through the Istio API, but there is such an object in Istio called Envoy filter. And by this filter, you can go and configure Envoy uh, by yourself. Uh, so you can use uh, this Envoy filter to configure uh, using some uh, caching. Uh, mechanism, for example, Hazelcast. Uh, and then you can configure the Hazelcast instance. You can configure where to connect to this instance, or actually you can use any other uh, caching tool which, which is available. Uh, so out of the box, Easter doesn't provide it, but with the more advanced configuration, it's possible to leverage the Envoy uh, caching uh, uh, filter for, for using the cache. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I see no comments, but actually, I uh, i mean questions, but I can see a few comments that uh, people really appreciate your, uh, your presentation, especially demo sessions, and they are very excited about your skills. So thank you very much, Serhi. Thank you very much. So I, if you have any questions, maybe you want to try the application afterwards, since it's uh, available on the GitHub, so you can 
try to run it locally or try to use any cloud provider which have the free tire. Uh, just contact me. You have uh, here my contacts. Just contact me and I will be glad to help you with any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, see you. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, uh, guys, thank you very much to all of you who join us uh, tonight. And uh, if you like Serhi's presentation, please do not forget to leave your feedback and you are welcome to join, uh, to join our further uh, IT talks and other events. Oh, by the way, Marta, I would be yes. very thankful if you could send me the feedbacks afterwards so of course. I, I can know uh, what can be improved here. Of course, no problem. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much and have a great night all. Thank you. Bye-bye.